As I, in my own journey, became menopause literate, perimenopause literate, meaning I dug deep, I found that 80% of women will experience a six or seven symptom or diagnosis syndrome that has to do with their musculoskeletal system. 80%, 41% of the time when they go to the doctor and have tests run, nothing is found. So if you go to a typical doctor who is not menopause literate and you say these things, you walk away feeling defeated and like you're crazy. And women would say that to me. They would say, I don't know, Von, Dr. Vonda, what's going on. I feel like I'm falling apart and I feel like I'm going crazy because people tell me there's nothing wrong. Hello, my Bettys, and welcome back to another episode of Better with Dr. Stephanie. It's me, your host, Dr. Stephanie Estima. And today I bring you a conversation about muscles and menopause with none other than Dr. Vonda Wright. Dr. Wright is a double board certified orthopedic surgeon. She's an internationally recognized researcher, an elite team doctor. Her pioneering research in mobility and musculoskeletal aging is changing the way that we view and treat the aging process. And her passion for advancing her field is evident in her expertise with cutting edge orthobiologic techniques, including PRP for arthritis. What did we talk about today? Well, uh, Dr. V and I talked about the musculoskeletal syndrome of menopause. So we talked about arthralgia and inflammation and decreasing estradiol and the effect that that has on our joints, our bone density, our muscle mass, and the phenotype of fat and how that changes as we are progressing through menopause. We talk a lot about frozen shoulder, which is also a condition that you'll often see happening with you see it in men and women, but it is markedly more so in our female population. We talk about how to lift heavy and Dr. Vonda outlines her training protocol around lifting heavy and it's her it's push in the upper body pull in the upper body push in the lower body pull in the lower body and she outlines exactly how and how often and when we talk about zone two training we talk about zone five and six training otherwise known as sprinting and we talk about injury prevention stability instability training into our instability so that we can become more resilient as we age Vonda and I had so much in common. We had such a wonderful conversation. I was getting so excited during the conversation. My AV guy was like, turn down your mic. You're talking too loud. <laughs> so uh, he will correct for that. Don't worry. You don't have to deal with that. But without further delay, please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Vonda Wright. All right. And we are live with Dr. Vonda Wright. I am just thrilled to welcome you to the show. Welcome, Vonda. Welcome, Doc. Thank you so much for having me. I had reached out to you initially, just love uh, your work. And I love the framing that you talk about being an orthopedic surgeon. And yes. we're going to talk about your clinical, uh, some of the patterns that you see mm -hmm. in clinic and in the and in the OR. But you talk about this menopause or the musculoskeletal syndrome of menopause. And I thought yes. we might start there to frame this up yeah. in terms of what it is that you're seeing. What is the MSK syndrome of menopause? Yeah. And let's just start there and, yeah. and, and dive in. So, you know, week after week, I'm still a practicing surgeon. As you've said, I see patients in clinic twice a week. I operate once or twice a week. And it really informs everything you see me talking about uh, on social media, the thing, the articles I write. Because, you know, not one week goes by that I don't have a midlife woman coming in with pain that she can't tell me when it started. It was not related to an injury. Maybe it's her shoulder. Maybe her knees have gotten so much worse. But when she's in the midlife sector, which I, I place us in midlife between about 35 and 70, it's a 35-year span, when we arrive in a clinic like mine, with multiple things that have no one root cause, when that started happening, I dug deep and I started researching, what could this be? What is this? And then when I went through my own midlife, you know, I like to say at 40, I was in the best shape of my life. I was training for triathlon. I had 90% body fat, building a big career. And then at 47, I thought I was going to die but there was nothing wrong with me. I went to the cardiologist. I, I've tried to figure out what all these changes were because I was not yet menopause literate. And as I, in my own journey, became menopause literate, perimenopause literate, meaning I dug deep, I found that 80% of women will experience 
a six or seven symptom or diagnosis syndrome that has to do with their musculoskeletal system. 80%, 41% of the time when they go to the doctor and have tests run, nothing is found. So if you go to a typical doctor who is not menopause literate and you say these things, you walk away feeling defeated and like you're crazy. And women would say that to me. They would say, I don't know, Von, Dr. Vonda, what's going on. I feel like I'm falling apart and I feel like I'm going crazy because people tell me there's nothing wrong. So once I became menopause literate and knew that 80% of women will present with a musculoskeletal sign in perimenopause and 25% of us will be devastated by it, like I was. I could barely get out of bed. And I'm an old athlete. I never felt my body. My body always did what I needed it to do. I started digging deep. And so the things that are in the musculoskeletal syndrome of menopause, the nomenclature for which I crafted after the gynecourinary syndrome of menopause because there was a framework, include arthralgia, which is pain all over without a known injury. Number two, it is high inflammation, and that's what frozen shoulder falls under, which we can talk about. It is rapid progression of cartilage matrix uh, degradation, which means that men before 50 have more arthritis. Women after 50 have markedly more arthritis, and it's because of the role of estrogen on the cartilage matrix. Everybody knows or should know by listening to you and me and all the other menopause, that we will lose 20% of our bone density around the perimenopause and acute drop in estrogen phase unless we get in front of it. And that we will also lose a huge proportion of our muscle mass, our strength within our power. And finally, I put this in the musculoskeletal basket. We will accumulate or transition our body fat we may have the same percent body fat, although not likely, but it will be in our abdomens. It will be abdominal body fat versus visceral. These five or six things, the musculoskeletal syndrome of menopause, uh, menopause affect 80% of us. So the fact that people are listening to me on social media is because it is so common and people think they're crazy. Yeah, and they're told they're crazy. So we have arthritis. So I'm just going to repeat them back to you. Arthralgia, increased inflammation, rapid degradation of the cartilage matrix under the influence of a rapid uh, declining of estradiol, okay. bone density loss, muscle mass loss, and then the phenotype of fat changing. Yes. So we're yes. moving from like the subcutaneous, as you mentioned, to yes. more of the visceral fat, which is the like the naphal de like the you know the fat accumulation okay. on on our organs. Yeah. So the arthrout, let's let's just double click for a moment on the joint pain. Do we yeah. also, in your clinical experience, do you also see a decrease in passive range of motion as well as active? So if you are able to like, let's say it's a head rotation, for example, mm. or even just like a shoulder abduction, is it a reduction in passive and active range of motion as well? So it depends what we're talking about. I want to I frame this in in all aging, all passage of time, unless we get in front of it, the good news that is that joint economy and joint mechanics can be completely altered with practice, daily investment, yeah. right? So, mm -hmm. but if we don't, one of the reasons you see typical, very old people, 90 or above, shuffling along with very little joint motion, their hips don't move, is because the covalent bonds between tendon and ligament and all the collagen type material in our body get stronger with age. We become more fibrotic, if you will, less flexible. Yeah. So that will happen with or without the decline in estrogen, number one. Number two, what I see with decline in estrogen, now in men, when you look at hormone tables in men, they, they have an elevated rise through puberty and then their hormones stay pretty stud stable throughout a lifetime. Women's hormones are much different. If you look at the life of female hormones, when we're in our 40 years, we're having our period, every month our hormones are going up and down like mountains and yeah, valleys. Every day. Every day. <laughs> but yeah. then when, we, when our ovaries retire, when they have done their job, there is a precipitous drop. Well, mm. what is the effect on the inflammatory system? 
estrogen is a huge anti-inflammatory hormone in the body. It acts on the immune system through a molecule called the inflammasome. Without the intervention of estrogen, our whole bodies increase in inflammation, not just in our blood, but in our joints. So that's why women show up uh, with frozen shoulder, right? They're, it's the most typical um, presentation. But then women also have stiff hips. They have stiff knees. They just feel tighter than they used to. And that is all because of the inflammatory influence on the soft tissue of the capsule, for instance, in the shoulder. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, it's a yeah, no, systemic makes, thing. It's a systemic thing. And it's part of the reason why, I mean, certainly you know this um, as well as I do, but for you know, for our listeners, we know this why there's typically a phasic, we see cardiovascular disease rates in women often catch up to men, but there's a phasic shift. There's a delay in terms of the onset because of that protective effect that, mm -hmm. as you're describing, that estrogen has on the body and in particular, you know, I had uh, Ben Bickman on the show and he said, you know, up until menopause, women are kind of like metabolic superheroes. And part of that is because it's of estrogen. the, right, it's because it's estrogen, right? Uh -huh. Because we have this cardioprotective, you know, the, the effect that it has on, on our arterial walls and the suppleness and the pliability, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, so what you're describing is, is completely in line with that. And that 80% of women are going to be experiencing one or all of the in one or more of all of these symptoms yes you know we can do better you know we should we should have more you know i like the menopause that's awesome so we need more we need more practitioners and clinicians in the menopause yeah. or just you know menopause literate clinicians who are able to maybe identify or even predict that this might happen like 80 percent, you're going to be right most of the time that's right. and i remember i remember watching i think it was i think it was oprah who was saying it was maybe late forties for her. And she started having these heart palpitations. Yes. So, you yeah. know, Oprah has access to the mm -hmm. best resources yeah. arguably on the planet. Yeah. And her cardiologist put her on a heart medication. You know, it was oh. like, oh, there's, you know, it's a, I think she was put on a, I can't remember what she was put on. It wasn't a statin, but she was put on something maybe for her to regulate her arrhythmia. Yeah. Yeah. And, and her cardiologist who was female, missed that it might have been part of a larger picture of the transition from perimenopause to menopause. So I remember when she was saying this and then she ended up getting on estrogen eventually. Yeah. And she was like, this is just, it was just like the gods, you know, like the yeah. clouds parted yes. and you know the angels started singing. And I remember thinking like, God, if, if they can, if Oprah's doctors can miss it, you know, well, what are the hopes that, you know, the average Jane, right, yeah. is going to be able to get the care that she needs without being herself partially literate That's and, right. her, and, and, and her doctors. So just wanted to mention that. And then you also, you also mentioned that you yourself at about 47, you felt like you were going to you know, be an athlete for yeah. your whole life, that you felt like you were going to die. Can you explain what, is it some of these symptoms that you're describing? Is it is. What happened to you? Yeah. Thank you for letting me tell my menopause story. So at the time that this hit me, I was not menopause literate. In fact, I knew it was going to happen, but probably not to me, right? I mean, it was just that denial. <laughs> So 47 comes along. I don't know what you're talking about. I have I never no idea. Had that myself. Yeah. <laughs> okay, not me. You guys, you guys yeah. are all going to go through That's menopause, right. not me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not me. So you know what? I too had heart palpitations at night. And I literally thought that my heart was pounding out. It was chest pain. I could... So I went to a very reputable, I mean, the best that University of Pittsburgh had cardiologist. And we did a stress test. And he's like, mm. your heart is fine. Your ejection fraction is perfect. And I'm like, okay, okay, I'm not actually dying. So I was having heart palpitations. I was having trouble getting out of bed. I was so inflamed. My whole body hurt. Hot, the, all the things, hot flashes, brain fog. I didn't realize how irritable I was. I thought I was enraged at my job because of my job. But frankly, I had one of the best jobs for an orthopedic surgeon in the country. So all these things that I didn't know, and, and you're going to laugh and everybody laughs when I tell them this, but I was an athlete my whole life. So I had long spurts of amenorrhea, meaning I didn't have a period for six or nine months. And I'm like, I'm just so athletic. It's what I do my whole life until perimenopause. And suddenly I had regular periods and they were really heavy. And I felt cr all the things that all my friends were having. And I thought, oh my God. Finally, I'm a woman at 47. It was, <laughs> I, made it. I made it. It was perimenopause. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. It was the imbalance of, you know, estrogen versus progesterone. So that's when I did a deep dive and became very knowledgeable in all the things so that I can talk to people, not just about the musculoskeletal, but the role of estrogen and prevention of all the things you've talked about, including heart disease, possibly dementia, definitely bone loss, definitely muscle loss. So, you know, I agree with your last guest, Med we're metabolic superheroes because estradiol is the best biohack our ever our body ever invented. I love that. So what how did you resolve it? Well, first yeah. I did. I at first I stopped eating sugar. Mm -hmm. So sugar is a also a huge anti-inflammatory and as I tried to solve this with diet and mobility, I quit eating all added sugar and and three things happened. I no longer hurt anymore. So sugar solved that for me, not estradiol, which I do take now. Sugar solved that for me. And I lost 12 pounds, which I wasn't trying to do, but I did because Americans eat 16 pounds of added sugar a month without even knowing it. Just read a, a month? A month? Oh yeah. Read labels, right? What? Yeah. So just, it adds up like 32 grams of added sugar and you eat that all day. So those two things happened, but then I got really smart and es and made the decision after reading landmark book, Estrogen Matters, because I needed all the data in one place by Avram Blooming and Carol Tavares. And uh, at first I had someone put me on estradiol and progesterone, micronized progesterone, because I still have my uterus. And now I prescribe it for myself, just one of the things about being a doctor. And I have chosen, after reviewing all of my own risks, after look reading the whole book to get all the data, I have decided that I'm going to live forever on transdermal estradiol and micronized progesterone. But every woman gets to make that choice. And I always tell people, we must be driven by science, surrounding ourselves by science, and not living in fear because of what we read in the grocery store tabloids or hear a wives tale in the nail salon. We got to know it ourselves. And that's what happened when I became menopause literate. Or the wives tales from the WHI. <laughs> oh, even by a bunch of, you know, <laughs> yeah. medical. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. God. Yeah. I mean, we've done, we've had several conversations about the women's health initiative on the show. I've yep. done actually an entire solo episode on all of the the way that they you know splice the data even the the participants of the of the study and all of the risk factors that they had you know yes. main all mainly obese many smokers over you know, 70 age. yeah premarin right. yeah right yeah. over 70 right. premarin yeah yeah all of that so sometimes and i think truthfully and i've said this before so all my betties are gonna be like yep here she's going she's going she's going, talking about the whi again <laughs> but i feel like this is one of the biggest disservices to women in this century because it really did you know we were talking before we got going about the research that you had discovered and we're going to talk about this in uh -huh. terms of the satellite cells around uh -huh. muscles and now we're really starting to see some of the original research that you saw that you just that you were working on in your lab uh -huh. really propagated everywhere and in this, and the the exact opposite of that is is very true in terms of what we saw from the WHI. So twenty years later, you know, yeah. came out about I think it was two thousand and one, the original publication or two thousand yeah two thousand one, and we still have doctors that refuse hormone therapy or they're they're hesitant with their patients because they think it's going to cause heart attacks, mm -hmm. breast cancer, all all the things. So well, yeah. I would just encourage them. You know, every doctor in the country, every type of clinician in the country must recertify periodically. And to do that, you have to accumulate a lot of continuing medical medical education hours, if you will. Yeah. And so there really is no excuse for subspecialties who deal with women the most. You know, if we can call them out if we want. I mean, it's a little weird for an orthopedic surgeon to be prescribing hormones, but I've done the deep dive and I know the science and I do now. But for the, what I guess I'm trying to say is we have, we are required to keep up to date. It is part of being a cl doctor, a clinician. It's part of your license. It's part CECs, of our license. Right? The yeah. other thing is all good doctors and, and I have, I mean, I'm an orthopedic sports doctor. So when I take care of an elite team, elite person or mere mortals like me, if I am not the right consultant, I have a whole consultancy of my go-to people. Like the other day, I had a kid who needed a, a thoracic surgeon. I'm not gonna do this procedure that needs it, but I know the person 
and mm -hmm. I refer them. So just to clarify, I am not asking every orthopedic surgeon or chiropractor or any other subspecialty to become an expert in menopause, but what I am asking, demanding, encouraging you to be better is to know enough to say, it seems like you are in perimenopause, it's complicated, there's a lot to it, here's the person to talk to. Instead of gaslighting women into believing that they're going crazy or by saying something absurd like, oh, it's, you're just getting old, live with it. Well, I'm sorry, Stephanie. There are, we don't say that to men when they have erectile dysfunction. We right. invent 29 drugs for erectile dysfunction, right? We don't say that to other people. Why are we saying that to women or even ourselves? Oh, goodness. I could not agree with you more. It's it, it, The absurdity of it is, imagine a male went into their primary healthcare provider or whomever and said, you know, my libido's low. I'm not feeling myself brain fog. And the doctor said to them, you know what you need? You probably need a hobby. You know, why don't, why don't you take up woodworking oh or you know, just why that would never happen. It would never happen. It would never happen. Yeah. And when I say it, you can hear how ridiculous that sounds. Yeah. But women are told that all that, you know what it is, you know, you need, you know, you just need to relax. It is, it's all in your head. It's it's a part of eight. It's like none of that is an appropriate response ever. No, but eight, it is none never, of it. it isn't. But you know what? It's not only as it pertains to menopause. Let's take heart disease, for instance. I was the president of the American Heart Association in Atlanta when I was practicing in Atlanta. And it was a, it was a, a platform for me to say, listen, when men have a heart attack, they clutch their chest, they can't breathe, they fall down. Everybody knows what that is. Yeah. They get rushed to the hospital, they get oxygen and nitro, and we save their lives. They're up to the cath lab. When a woman has heart symptoms, it's often fatigue and malaise and strange pains. And she is told to do exactly what you said. Go lay down, get a hobby, work off the stress. And so women are, are discovered later, right? So... It's called it's called Yentl syndrome. I don't know if you remember this ancient movie where Barbara Streisand was it was in it in the 70s or 80s. It was all about this young scholar who could not get to the she it, she wanted to read the Torah, but to get to read that book, she had to pretend to be a man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this Yentl syndrome was described in, in Nature, the magazine, the journal, years ago as this disparate access to healthcare by simply being XX and the gaslighting and women present differently and therefore get different access. So for all the Bettys and everybody else listening, it's not just as it pertains to menopause, it's in all health. And so I just posted about this this morning. I feel very strongly that as the majority, women are 51% of the population in this country. We do not exercise our power of voting with our dollar. We control $31.8 trillion of consumer spending a year. We do not register to vote. We do not educate ourselves enough so that we can enter into an intelligent conversation with our clinicians so that if you are turned away, you can say, but here is the data that I have found. Right. So in those three ways, I'm not blaming women. I'm just saying, if you want something, go get it. We are the 51%. Amen. Yeah. Couldn't have said it better myself. I love that. And the, the other thing I'll add to this, and I, I want to move to frozen shoulder, but I'm just enjoying this so much right now. So I'll just stay here for a second. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> yeah. It's it, the, the, there's such a double standard, I think. So if a woman is trying to get pregnant and she's having trouble getting pregnant, uh -huh. you know that her doctor is going to run a full panel of hormones. Let's look at your thyroid. Let's look at your yes. progesterone. Let's look at your estrogen. Let's look at your... But if she's in perimenopause and menopause and going in and complaining about brain fog or not feeling like herself, uh -huh. Uh -huh. You, have, you have to advocate for yourself because you the likelihood of your doctor saying let's run a full thing. Let's look at your thyroid. Let's look mm -hmm. at your estradiol. Let's look at your, th is, is lower than if you are talking about pregnancy. So mm -hmm. obviously being a mother and becoming pregnant is one of the greatest blessings that I've ever experienced in my life. Mm -hmm. And I would not have it any other way. Mm -hmm. And as a 46 year old woman, mm -hmm. I do think that 
being an advocate in the doc for yourself yes. in a loving way with your primary care yeah. uh, provider you should be able to ask for those hormones and they should be given to the like, testing of those hormones and, yes. and you should be able to receive that and it shouldn't matter whether or not you want a baby or not oh right exactly it has nothing to do with our fertility it has to do with our life cycle if you will yeah. not our menstrual cycle which happens to be part of it yeah. but our life cycle we all every organism goes through a life cycle so do humans why would we expect it to be different yeah yeah well said we're gonna have to continue this over coffee let's, <laughs> yes let's let's <laughs> i want to talk about frozen shoulder yes i saw this in practice all the time way more frequent in women than in men talk to me a little bit about and you mentioned already some of the like the adidas the adidas capsulitis that happens yeah. when we see the decrease in estradiol yep. in our going through menopause but talk to us about what you're seeing in your patients when yes. you're uh, operating them on the OR, in in the operating room mm -hmm. and what are some of the signs and symptoms of mm -hmm. frozen shoulder mm -hmm. yeah let's start there so first i want to uh, clarify frozen shoulder can happen in men and women it is an inflammatory process so people men and women with diabetes and out of control blood glucose and hemoglobin A1Cs off the charts, 7, 8, 13, I've seen 14, 15. Such highly inflamed people, the inflammation is what aggravates the capsule of the shoulder. Now, add on top of that, losing your estrogen, which protects us then from inflammation. Women who come to me in midlife, I had, I had four women on Thursday come with this, say things like, my shoulder is excruciating. It's, I did nothing. I didn't, I, I didn't hit it on anything. I didn't do any activities and it won't move. And they'll show me, they're like this, it doesn't move. You know, it's, it's down below my waist and they can't hook their bra. Internal rotation with your hand behind your back is actually the first motion that people lose. That's what people come to me saying. When they say that to me, I, do not take up that conversation right away. I start talking about perimenopause to frame for them why they are like this because the first instinct is that they hurt it or did something wrong. That's number one. So then once I return to the shoulder, I try to move it for them. And often it's almost like there's a physical block to motion. Once we, I try to move it in forward flexion and internal rotation. Well, here's- and this is in the freeze phase. Like they usually, people don't, so there's, for, for, for those listening, there's usually three phases that we talk about with frozen shoulders. Like I think it's freezing, frozen, and then the thawing. recovery is called thawing, thawing. <laughs> which is funny. But, but the, the, yeah. the, the irony is that you're really hot and red inside. Not, yeah. <laughs> right, it's, it's sure. opposite. You're not cold, it's not it, cold at all. It's not yeah. cold, fire and ice, it's the fire, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. So, um, when people are freezing and in the frozen stage, it won't move. But this thawing period can take two years. Who can live like that? Yeah. And it's excruciating to thaw out. So my algorithm for treating people is A, talking about estradiol, encouraging them to, to learn about it via the ways we've already talked about it, to talk to their primary care doctor or OB. And if they are without resource, talk to me about their hormones because I'm happy to help them with that. We always keep these shoulders moving. Our instinct is to keep them frozen to the side and very rapidly you will lose all motion. So get them in some good physical therapy, teach them how to move it at home. If it's just too excruciating to do that, I will sometimes put a steroid injection into their, a place called this uh, subacromial space, which just bathes the entire inside capsule. I'm gonna describe what the capsule is. I'll do that now. So. The layers of your body are you see your skin and the fat underneath your skin and then you get to a muscle layer. The big muscles you see in the mirror when we're lifting biceps, triceps, lats, delts, that's the layer on the outside. Below that you have four little bitty rotator cuff muscles that actually move your shoulder and inside of that you have a capsule. It's like, I call it the inside skin. It's the capsule it's soft, it's, it's billowy, it becomes so inflamed, it contracts and becomes very tight. And when I put an arthroscope or a needle scope into the shoulder to look, instead of being pure white and glistening like a shoulder should be, like think of new fallen snow if you live in a cold place. It is hot, 
and red like a furnace inside with capillaries going everywhere because it's just so inflamed. No wonder it hurts. So if we cannot help it resolve by moving with therapy, with home exercises, with a steroid injection, I am now applying the power of the anti-inflammatory effect of platelet-rich plasma, which is your body's own growth factors housed in your platelets to try to decrease the inflammation. If none of that works, I will take people to the operating room, put them to sleep, and move their shoulder for them. I just gently move it, and the scar tissue will break up, and that's usually enough. And then they go to therapy five days in a row afterwards, and they'll get more than 50% of their motion back to jump start it. If I can't even move it in the operating room, then sometimes I do put the scope in and physically open the capsule, and it will heal back in a looser configuration. I try not to do that ever, but sometimes, mm -hmm. occasionally we have to. So that's yeah. the full spectrum of treating this sh shoulder freezing. Now, I just want to clarify, because I get a lot of questions about this. Loss of estrogen is not the only reason your body hurts. You can still have a legitimate rotator cuff tear or a meniscal tear in your knee. We still can be injured, but 41% of the time when we do imaging, there's nothing structural going on. I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, no, I'm happy you did because you can have the sort of primary and secondary reasons why mm -hmm. you're having FSS, right? Mm -hmm. So the primary would be an injury and then the secondary is what you're what you're describing right. where it, it doesn't there's no traumatic there's no trauma in the history you know in the patient's history yes. and then there's this been this slow degradation the you know that freezing phase mm -hmm. where they're where they're losing mobility mm -hmm. i wanted to share something with you which i think you'll appreciate and it's more from what i learned as a as a chiropractor as a practicing chiropractor because you might imagine physical therapists and chiropractors massage therapists i would assume as well osteopaths we tend to see before they get to a surgeon, they might come for care to a PT or, or a DC or what have you. One of my mentors, when I was when I was learning more about frozen shoulder, because it, it just seemed like overnight, I, I had all the frozen shoulder patients and I did not know what to do with them. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I need to take myself some courses here. Um, some of the thinking, and I, I, I love the explanation that you're giving with the hormonal etiology potentially, and then the inflammatory okay. uh, etiology. These are sort of chemical mediators or chemical roots of why things are going a little awry. Mm -hmm. what, I, what I learned, and I'll share with you, and I would love your feedback on it, is that there can also be, and something like frozen shoulder, you're gonna sort of have multifactorial things, more of a neuro, neuromechanical dysfunction, where there may be dysfunction, let's say, in the nerves exiting at the cervical spine, at the, in the cranium, at the occipital atlantal joints. And then that is gonna create, I'm hoping I'm doing my mentors justice here, but that's gonna create dysfunction in the way that the trapezius muscle mm. operates because uh -huh. you have those cranial nerves going to the traps. Uh -huh. And then that's gonna set up the scapula for abherent motion. And uh -huh. that will set us up for like one of the first clinical signs of, of FSS, which is going to be that like improper positioning or that improper like scapular humeral motion or that like abduction, like usually we would call it like under 100 degrees of abduction is when we're starting to see some of that, you know, capsulitis or that frozen shoulder uh, taking place. And then when you have like poor, when the scapula now can't actually set the humerus up to turn in the subacromial space, like you were saying, now you're getting compression of the tissue and then the adhesions come and then you know, the second sort of hallmark again is like pain. So you were mentioning like it's the lack, it's the range of motion, but then it's also the pain on initiation of the motion, which is also one of the sort of clinical hallmarks. And then of course the adhesions just, you do this for two, three, four years, and then you, you, you develop, you know, these adhesions in the, in the capsule. I wanted your, your My thoughts initial on that. thoughts on yeah. that. Yeah. I yeah. think it's interesting that you brought that up because people, it's normal to protect themselves. What people don't realize is that all the nerve roots that feed your entire shoulder and arm come out of your cervical spine, right? So mm -hmm. at every level, there's an exiting nerve that travels varying distances down your arm. So the high nerves that innervate high up in your neck into your traps, which the Bettys probably know this, but my people may not, is this muscle right here. If that's inflamed or the nerve is firing in a, uh, we call it radicular, in a stinging matter, it is normal for you to do this, to protect right. it. You don't want to have it hanging yeah. down. You want to do this. Well, do this for a week. That shoulder is so sensitive. 
doing this for a very short amount of time will limit the motion in your shoulder. And so when I'm trying to help people understand the origin of their pain, it's not always your shoulder. Sometimes it's your neck, right? And, and you just have to go down that pathway with people. Are we treating the neck? Are we treating the shoulder? Or are we doing primarily neck and now shoulder because nothing's moving, the scapula's stuck on the back of the thoracic spine? Right. Yeah. So interesting you brought that up. I don't get to talk about that very often. I, I thought you might not, and I thought you might appreciate it yeah. because I think there's so much overlap in terms of your body of knowledge and, and my body of knowledge and our shared clinical experience. But I, I love, to, I would say this all the time in practice. People will come in with, let's say, you know, they'd say, my shoulder hurts mm. here. You know, it's right. Like, well, not your shoulder. Not exactly, exactly <laughs> right. your shoulder, but yeah. let's take a look at your neck, yeah. right? And let's take yeah. a look at the mobility, active, passive mm-hmm. range of motion. For, you know, what What is your capacity to turn? What's your capacity? capacity to laterally flex, flex, extend, et cetera. And uh, people would be shocked. You know, we would, we would direct care at the neck and their shoulders here. And sometimes here, (laughs) but also I'm pointing to my traps for those who are listening on audio. Yeah. So, you know, people would have pain in their traps, Mm -hmm. but because of that ridiculous pain that you were describing, the nerves that are coming off of the, the, the cervical spine and going into the upper, upper arm were being affected. So they were either being crushed at the exit point at the joint or somewhere along. Yeah. Or distally. Yeah. Yeah. So, let, let, maybe let's talk a little bit about muscle mass because frozen shoulder is something we know affects both men and women, a markedly higher incidence in women. Yes. Are there strategies that a woman in her 30s or 40s yes. might be thinking about mm-hmm. where she can say, okay, I want to be able to preserve my range of motion. I want to be able to set my shoulders and other articulations up. So it's not, I mean, sho- frozen shoulder is the most obvious because as you said, like the aptly scratch mm-hmm. test or like the unhooking yeah. of the bra thing. Mm-hmm you know, doesn't happen. So are there things that we can start putting into place as a 35 year old, as a 45 year old woman Mm -hmm. that you think are impactful in preventing or at least lessening the incidence or the severity of frozen shoulder? Well, I love that you bring this up because I do a whole series for millennials who are now 43, right? Mm -hmm. And so 110 million people and 51% will have to talk about these things So it's really important. So as a 35 year old, full of estrogen, full of youthful vigor, still able to maintain bone density and muscle mass, I call 35 to 45, pardon me people, the critical decade to get your shit together. Because (laughs) I know, I'm so sorry, I'm an orthopod. We talk this way. Yeah, it's time. So I know you're busy with your careers. I know you're, if you've decided to have children, you're hot in the middle of little people. But now's the time to learn. So now's the time to pick up estrogen matters so that you can know ahead of time what you're going to need. Now is the time to eliminate simple carbs from your life and focus on fiber so that when you do become highly inflamed, that's not not another addictive battle you have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Number three, get into an anti-inflammatory lifestyle, not just food diet, that includes building lean muscle mass. Make it such a part of your life, one, one activity at a time, that it's not so harrowing in midlife to start it all at one time, right? Oh my God, how do I deal with menopause and loss of muscle and loss of bone and all the things won't be quite as hard if we get menopause literate, midlife mis- mid literate, and start layering on. Maybe you do nothing about it right now, but you have the years to layer on education. Then you start walking every day in zone two. Then you add, let's go to, the, now that I am mobile every day, now we're going to learn how to lift weights. I'm getting too animated. I'm knocking my computer off. <laughs> I know. I get so passionate about it. Now, I'm so excited. I love seeing you get this excited. It's awesome. <laughs> yes. Now we're going to go to the gym and we're going to learn to lift so that when you get to midlife, you can lift really heavy because that's how you're going to stimulate muscle protein synthesis and satellite cell reproduction. So that you see what I'm doing instead of when you're 49 or 52, you're like, oh my God, I've got the whole world to do. You layer on year after year, so it's not so hard. Totally prepared, you'll know your body, your joints will move, you'll have the muscles to support it. When you start getting stiff or 
having brain fog, heart hot flashes, night sweats, all the things, you're like, perimenopause, let's go. It's You're going into known territory instead of entering a wilderness that you know nothing about. That, to me, is what the critical decade is all about. Yeah. And, you know, I think this sort of speaks to your, I'll say, salt, if you will, like your salt as a coach or your salt as a doctor, because I think the best doctors and the best coaches Mm -hmm. are able to predict your experience for you so that you don't misinterpret it once you get there. Oh, I love that. So what what you're talking about is actually framing up for them the next 10 or 15 years of their life so that they're not shocked when they're 47, maybe as you were, or they're not shocked when they're 49. Right at the at the changes in their body and they've right. put into place all of these different bricks right or these yeah. different pieces of the of the puzzle that's created a really f- stable foundation so i just love that Aww. i get this question asked a lot and i'm very curious to see how you might answer it which is what does li- heavy lifting mean i love that you asked that well the good news is that we are all individuals and you don't have to be anybody you don't want to be. So that applies to heavy lifting. Heavy lifting, in order to stimulate muscle protein synthesis and the reproduction of satellite cells means lifting in the primary lifts. So this is why you might have, if you've never lifted before, you might need a little instruction and there's lots of good resources. A push-pull for your arms and a push-pull for your legs. It's power lifting. So push-pull for your arms is pushing is some kind of bench press motion, whether it's with barbell, free weights. I don't love machines, but push. Pull is trying to learn to do a pull-up, any pull motion. For the legs, it's squats, whether it's back squats with a bar, all kinds. There must be a thousand kinds of squats. Or, and deadlift which is the pull those four push pull push pull those are the compound motions and i like my women to do i try to make it easy four reps for four sets no not 20 reps for four sets with mamby pamby pink weights no you might as well spend your time doing something else if you want to be powerful and be able to do everything you want to do. Get up off the floor, not get on the floor in the first place by falling over. Pick up your grandkids. You need lots of muscle fibers firing at once, which is power. You must stimulate them to work that way with heavy lifting. Now, those are the four compound type of lifts. But there are all kinds of accessory lifts to support that. So when I talk about bench press on a bench day for me, I'll bench press as my heavy compound lift, four reps, four sets. And then I will accessorize biceps, triceps, lats, delts, rows. I do eight reps, three or four sets. Never do we lift 15, 20 reps because that's building endurance. I'm not trying to gain endurance as my primary superpower. I want to be be powerful not lifting forever enduring. Here's an example. I can biceps curl 15 pounds until tomorrow morning. It's no longer hard for me. But I can only curl 25 pounds four times before I'm exhausted, right? It's that effort that is going to help me. Does that make sense? Makes total sense. I have a thousand questions now. What is your rest time like? So I would assume, so four reps, four sets. So four reps, you're trying to, I assume that the goal here is to get as close to muscle failure without actually failing, Mm -hmm. right? And you're trying to maintain, maybe there's some break in form, but it's near perfect form to try and move. If if you're doing, let's say a bench press or you're doing a dead or whatever. So we're trying to have near perfect form as close to muscle failure as possible. What does your rest time look like? Do you have like a set time or are you waiting for your heart rate to recover? Are you waiting for some of the accessory muscles to sort of come back to baseline before you do the, before you do the exercise again? Yes. That's a really good question. Um, because If you've never lifted compound and heavy before, for people who are just trying this, A, if you've never done it, invest in a trainer to help you with your form and getting started. It's it's hard to start alone, or if not a trainer, someone knowledgeable. I just want safety first. But to your point, for instance, if I know that I want in my last set of deadlift 
to do 175 pounds. Then I don't start at 175 pounds. I might st- I warm up with very little for to get the motion going, and then I increase yeah. I increase every set. But in my last set, when I when I'm working at 175 pounds, that's when I get to near exhaustion, right? So I want to make that point. In between each of these sets, my trainer that I that he's a strength conditioning coach that I learned from, we rest about three minutes because this is what I wanted to say. This is like aerobic work for me. My heart rate gets up when I'm lifting oh, like 100%. this. Oh, 100%. Yeah. yeah. So I yeah. let it come back down to about 130. It takes two to three minutes. And I don't lift as well if I cheat on the rest period in between. Sometimes with my squats, actually, I will do back, I, I do back squats, back squat, and then I'll go over and I'll do drop plyo. Like I'll climb up on a box and I'll drop down and I'll get a little bone work in during my yeah. rest because that doesn't take much energy to drop down off a box but it's it that gives me a little extra recovery time but a good question actually yeah i like that and i also like the idea of progressing the weight right because now you're not in in some ways and i'm, I'm assuming that you're doing a workout before you're just going in, and squatting like i'm assuming there's, oh, right. some, there's some type of yeah. warm-up, right yeah so you're mobilizing and the the, the joints and the tent and the just generally the connective tissue is not yeah. going to be shocked with right. 175 pound oh, deadlift no. right from the beginning and right. you're doing that 16 times right yeah <laughs> so, no 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 yeah. no yeah so my progression is i have the abundant opportunity and so thankful to do this thing that I'm saying, because my office is in a performance gym. It's built for high performers, <laughs> right? There's an indoor track. So I come out of my right. office, I'm right on the track. I'll walk for 30 minutes or something. Just, it clears my head from my patients. I'm getting into, I'm gonna work hard zone. When I'm done with that, I warm up every joint. There's a series of dynamic things, of hip swings and I, do hip motion and I do arm motion. I do all kinds of body twisty thing just to get my blood flowing and things moving. Then if it's a squat day, for instance, I do monster walks. I put a band around my ankle and I warm up my glutes and my posterior column, my back, so that things are warm, ready to receive this bar. Because, you know, I'm 57 and I'm really healthy. Think I work at it. I'm really healthy. But if I just get under a bar and do this cold turkey, I'm going to hurt something. Yeah. 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 And I, I, I love that because that's what I do too. So on leg day, if I'm doing squats, I will just take the bar with no weights on it yeah. and I will just punch them. I'll do 15 or 20 or 25. So the intensity is still high. So it's it's a it's a low load, let's say a low mechanical load, but the intensity is really high. So by the end of the 20 or 25 reps, like yeah. my heart's going, like I'm starting right. to get a little bit warm. Mm-hmm. And then I might add on like a lighter weight for the second set for my warm up and then a bit more weight for the third set of my warm up. And then by the time my warm up set is done, like I'm kind of ready to go. Yeah. Right. So I yeah. I love that because I think a lot of people you know we're pressed for time and we yeah. just want to get in there and yeah. get in and out. And I think that the the warm up piece of it is really important because you are going to be as you know you're going to be warming up all the you know the hips and the whatever you know whatever it is if it's a sports specific warm-up that you're doing i think that that's super important Mm -hmm. i have a few more questions just about your programming if i if i may Mm -hmm. are you doing a full do you do splits like when you're doing let's say deads do you do deads and and squats on the same day do you do like a leg day i don't don't. i do i live four days a week and so each push pull gets its own day Cool. So yep. it goes leg, arm, leg, arm. And to do that, I, I have to lift on a weekend. You know, I just can't get four days in in the five days of the week. So mm-hmm. I'll lift on the weekend. And so the way I make my schedule yep. is I, I believe that lifting is primary, has primacy. So I put those on my calendar first. And then in between those, like I, I used to lift Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, but now I lift Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. If, in case you people want me to be that specific, but the alternate days I do zone two plus sprinting, <laughs> right? So, because if I somehow have to miss something, I'd rather miss zone two plus sprinting, even though that's very important, than my lifting, because lifting is what will help me most with longevity. Interestingly, I agree. I tend to agree with you. Yeah, and there's going to be a lot of Bettys that agree with you too. And I'll say, and I think I've been thinking very deeply about zone two mm-hmm. just as of late. I think it's a very important. 
and we'll let maybe we'll talk about i have so many more questions about your lifts but let me let's talk yeah. about zone two and then we'll, we'll see if we'll we come back to it we have women have way more type one fibers and to your point i mean you mentioned sprinting so we're going to talk about that as well but we lose type two as we age we lose speed and, and power, power. At a much more rapid rate than we lose our type one oxidative fibers. Mm -hmm. So I've been thinking about this a lot because for me, I like to train. I'm still, I like to lift six days a week. Mm -hmm. So I do uh, five or six, but if I'm really organized, it's six. And I like to do one shoulder, two shoulder days, two back days, two leg days. Nice. And so the, I, so for my shoulder days, as you might imagine, it's not a big I don't have a lot of systemic fatigue after doing shoulder. I don't have a lot of axial fatigue. Yeah. Like I'm not like, you know, when you have a barbell on your back, that's a, you're actually, you're loading the spine, yes, right? That's it's right. all axial mm -hmm. loading. Same with deads, right? It's yeah. all axial. So I don't really have that with a shoulder day. I don't really have any joint fatigue mm -hmm. or any, you know, connective tissue fatigue with that. So I will typically pair a zone two day, let's say mm -hmm. after shoulder. Mm -hmm. But I've been thinking about, do women need more speed training yeah. than we need? And I, I think we still need zone two. I still think we need a lot of zone two, but I just wonder if it's different because you see a lot of the, you know, a lot of people, a lot of male, we'll say influencers who will talk about zone two and it, it is very important. And I just wonder if it's different for us, like, do we need as much because we already have a higher concentration mm. of type one fibers or mm. do we need to be focusing more on sprinting and explosive movement that's just and i don't have the answer so i'm, I'm saying yes. it sort of mumbling like yes. it's all coming out as verbal you know <laughs> diarrhea at this point no no I don't no have a, yeah what do you what do you think about that yeah so the bettys probably know that the zones of training have to do with your heart rate which everybody's heart rate responds to different intensities of work there are people who walk across the office and are breathing heavy so it depends or and then Tour de France people can spin up a mountain for six hours and not break a sweat. And they're in zone two. And yeah. they're in zone two, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So here, here's the framework. And I used to be this person because I get bored pretty easily. But working out in high intensity intervals as your aerobic workout every day, it, it's a little trashy. Mm. It's not going to get us anywhere. We need to be more 100%. specific. So yeah. when we say zone two, we're working in a heart rate zone where we are optimally burning fat. Now, women do that better than men. We, we usually burn fat better than men anyway. But once we get out in an effort standpoint from a place where we can, our mitochondria are most efficient in burning fat and we need more energy because of the intensity we're pushing ourselves, we're going to start burning carbohydrates, which is faster, but we produce lactic acid our muscles then are poisoned by the acidic environment, blah, 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 all the things. So that if we're trying to avoid that place by, frankly, going slower. I mean, mm -hmm. I zone two at four incline and four speed, and my heart rate zone two is about 130. And when I do that for 45 minutes, it takes me about 15 to really warm up. But by the end of 45, I've broken a little sweat, but I can still talk to people on Instagram, which I do, right? That's zone two, and it's really great for metabolic efficiency and flexibility of your mitochondria to burn fat and flip back and forth. But women in particular need to sprint and go at max effort, which is not that medium zone where we get in places like Orange Theory which I used to do all the time, but wasn't enough of any one thing to really help anything. And I, I literally had a membership for years. I now know that that is not going to get me many places because I'm not lifting heavy enough and I'm not in a good heart rate zone at any point. So we need to sprint because it causes enough neuromuscular stimulation, stimula stimulation that we're going to fire more motor implants at one time and get powerful muscle contraction, which is what we need. It's going to be enough stimulation to cause mitochondrial flexibility, enough stimulation to stimulate the replication of satellite muscle stem cells. There's a reason why we need to work harder, but don't worry. We need to work harder for very short amounts of time. So the way I sprint and the way Stacy Sims suggests it is in very short bursts. 
So when I'm done with my 45 minutes of zone two, or maybe I walk home, my, I live two miles from my office, I walk home at a brisk pace, then I sprint for 30 seconds, which means all out. I, you know, as fast as my little legs can go, and I think it looks like Usain Bolt, and it looks more like, you know, an average person sprinting. But it feels really fast to me. But you uh, feel like Usain Bolt. You I feel, feel like, like it Bolt. because yeah. on the treadmill, I <laughs> pop up to 11 and I try not to fly off yeah. the back, right? For yes, 30 yes, seconds, yes. 30 seconds. Yeah. And then I totally turn, but I turn it down and then mm -hmm. recover my heart rate, which takes mm -hmm. me two to three minutes back to 130. And I only do that four times. That is what we're talking about when we do sprint intervals. Now there's another way to train. If we've, if we've mastered this, another way to train, if we're looking at maintaining or helping our VO2 max, which is, a, which is a hallmark of longevity, is three minutes as hard as we can go, and then three minutes total recovery. Three minutes hard as we can go. So it's probably not as fast More of like as- a Tabata style. A little bit, yeah. It's yeah. probably not as fast as your sprint interval because you got to yeah. do it for three minutes. But that's the way not to have a garbagey workout. Let's make it mean something. And it's also, I think it's worth also saying that sprinting in the way that you're describing is anabolic, right? Yeah. It is the only type of cardio that I'm aware of that is that is anabolic. Typically zone two, although it is very important, is still a catabolic activity. Like we are still burning something. We are burning the fuel, we're burning the substrate, we're burning the stored glycogen, whatever. Or the I should say that we're burning more, it's more of a fat burning activity. Sprinting is, you know, when you sort of look and it's it's very easy to look at a Usain Bolt or gosh, I'm trying to think of a woman. I, I'm just I know. Of jo I'm like Joiner, oh, what's her Richardson. name? The girl I used to look. Richardson. Rich, okay, so yeah. these beautiful these sprinters. These beautiful sprinters, yes. And if you look at them versus like the eight or the 4,000 meter, you know, it's always won by Kenyans. It's always like the Kenyans always dominate the sport. But, you know, the, the 4,000 meter mm -hmm. where they just look like their skin and bones. Yeah. They have, it, it's very much a catabolic. So I think that that's very important. And I like the three by three. I have something on the bike where it's 20 intervals. It's 12 seconds on, eight seconds rest. Mm -hmm. So it's like the total yes. thing is tw is 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. And it is such a hard workout, like yeah. the mental gymnastics. Mm -hmm. I have to, you know, I do not want to do this workout. I know. But I also think that there's something, when you're doing a sprint, which is an all out effort as you're describing, mm -hmm you really learn about yourself. Like yes. it, you really learn about how you deal with something that is very painful, this buildup of the lactate that stress, you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, yeah. the other thing from a mental standpoint that I can tell you, I mean, I'm, listen, I'm a surgeon. I have no problem with my ego, but when I lift heavy with a bar on my back or deadlifting or I goblet squat with a hundred pounds or, and I'm surrounded by all the, gym guys and I'm right there doing my little thing or I'm sprinting gosh I feel so empowered like this is the height of badassery right and so mm -hmm. there's this mental component with being able to force your body to do hard things that I think prepares you in other times when you need to draw on the resilience resource to do hard life things you know I, I think there is that back and forth mind body I, I couldn't agree with you more. There's, I think it's a song uh, from my kids when they were younger. They used to watch uh, Cars. It was this uh, movie. animated yeah. movie from Disney. And uh, the second Cars, there's this character. I think he's a, I think he's a Rolls Royce. But he says something like, "You never feel most alive than when you're almost dead." Oh. <laughs> and I think that that's so true. <laughs> you know, when you, when I've done a sprint, I yeah. just feel. You know, I do the four. I, I try to do the. I do, I try to do one in one. So I try to do one minute on, mm -hmm. one minute off, and I try to do that. You know know, eight to 10 times. And I'm done at right. the end of Just that, done. like 15 minutes, mm -hmm. I'm finished and I feel dead, but you also feel the most alive that you yeah, ever have. That's right. right. It's this fun paradox. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about, let's talk a little bit about injury prevention. We've been talking okay. about strength. Mm -hmm. I think strength and stability 
are two separate adaptations, right? So strength is the ability to exert force, right? Power is the, ex the ability to exert force quickly. Mm -hmm. Stability is resisting force. So we've been talking a little bit about the shoulder uh, girdle, you know, or the rotator cuff, right? So we know that we can create maybe a strength adaptation in the, sh in the rotator cuff would be, you know, holding a weight and then like externally rotating it, right? You know, infra and teres are working mm -hmm. there or whatever. Mm -hmm. But on your push days, right, when you're doing the bench press, mm -hmm. your rotator cuff is also working, right? Yes. But it's working in more of a stability, mm -hmm. like it's resisting the force and stabilizing yes. the area. Yeah. You've been very clear in terms of it's very important to be promoting one specific adaptation around mm -hmm. strength and power. Mm -hmm. How do you think about promoting stability? What are some of the things that you think about when for with the shoulder, let's say, which is one of the more common areas to be injured because of the degrees of freedom that yeah. it has? Mm -hmm. How do we how do we promote stability in an area like the shoulder yeah. or the hips or up, you know anywhere? Sometimes when we're in a gym or any anywhere looking at our muscles, we really do only see the big ones that we we've just been talking about it. But yeah. certainly for the shoulder, stability comes from the strength of the rotator cuff, which are teeny tiny muscles. They work in harmony to pull the humeral head, which is this hand into the plate of the shoulder blade. The shoulder blade is not a cup, it's a plate. The only thing that keeps the humeral head centered is the coordinated force of the rotator cuff. So mm. if we're hauling around weights and never once in your lifetime pay attention to the little bitty rotator cuff muscles by doing band work or doing something called a body blade, which is a crazy blade you hold in the gym that makes you work those, you may be able to lift heavy things, but your humeral head may be shifting back and forth within the plate. So we can't forget the small muscles surrounding our joints and in the shoulder, it's the rotator cuff. So the power lifting that we just described doesn't get to that. We, we should involve the smaller muscle groups. When it comes to the lower body, we start losing our ability to balance in space in our 20s. And it has nothing to do with muscle particularly. It has to do with the neuromuscular pathways from the brain to the end points, which is our muscles. So even 30 year olds who haven't worked on their balance are gonna reach for something and fall over. It's a common experience, but the good news is that we can totally retrain our balance by simple things like standing on one leg. I teach this to my people standing on wing, one leg to brush our teeth. So we're just a little off balance. Then if you want to really be fancy, you close your eyes. And when you start falling over, you grab the sink, right? So that's why we do yes. it when we're brushing our teeth. Yes. Or, you know, you can build balance on the gym with a BOSU ball. All of our activities, here's this, we can do this in a big gym. If all of our lifts are on two legs, it does not make us stable. But when we do lunges and squats and weighted squats on one leg, or we do step ups on a box, holding a, gob a goblet step up on a box on one leg, we are forcing the coordination of all the muscles to work together to stay stable because we don't have two solid legs, we have one. And so when we're doing that, if you notice your knee falling in on the, on the standing leg and your hip dropping, well, we're not stable. We right. need to be able to stand on one leg with the knee in line with the toes, with our pelvis staying stable. I tease, I tease people who come in, mostly women, but that we're not designed to walk like supermodels like this. We're actually not designed to right. walk like that. We're designed <laughs> yes. to walk like this. So that's bursitis waiting that, to happen. That is friends. so yeah. bursitis. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, so true. Yeah. It's, I love that you, I love that you said the one legged versus the two legged, because that's actually, you know, I, I think what you're talking about, and you can redirect me here if I haven't captured this well, but in order to improve your stability, you almost have to train into greater areas of instability and then train stability in those as a, as that, as a, that adaptation. Yes. So the example that you gave was like stepping up with one leg. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can't balance on one leg, you shouldn't be squatting with two. 
right? So you have to be able to train your stabilizers and the deep, mu like the deep muscles of the, you know, the erector spinae and whatever, the deep, or not, sorry, the deep muscles of the back, not the erector spinae, the deep muscles of the back to be able to like keep the hips yeah. balanced, let's yeah. say mm -hmm. that, or even with the shoulder, like, can you do windmills? Like, can you do weighted, yeah. you know, internal and external rotations of the arm? If you can't do that evenly on both sides, mm -hmm. maybe you shouldn't be, you know, I've, I, I, you, Right. Maybe you shouldn't be lifting. Maybe there's some rehab yep. or some, you know, balancing of biomechanics that has to happen initially before you get in the gym or in, in conjunction with your, your, your programming in the gym as well. Yeah. Such a good point because I know that I was just suggesting people go lift heavy, but the real point is if you have never done it before, that's why having someone help you to work through these kind of mechanics, see even what your joint mobility is. If we can't have full range of motion through our hips, our knees, and our ankles, then our fluid compound motions are just not going to happen and we'll have injury, frankly. The yeah. other reason, you know, we were talking about injury, something that I don't love because I get a I get a lot of injured people from it is that people pushing themselves or trainers pushing people past the point of exhaustion, right? I yeah. see it all the time. They're like, yeah. one yeah. more time or you can do 10 more. And what happens is when you're so exhausted and your muscles are almost quivering tetany, you have no fine motor control. And that's when people get hurt. It's on the last run of the mount down the mountain. It's on the last set of whatever they're doing. It's because yeah. you lose the fine motor control when you're just mm -hmm. the small muscles fatigue faster. Yeah. Yeah. Really well said. And I think without without stability i mean i did this for years i had to retrain myself how to squat because mm -hmm. i would do the ex i would get up to 185 pounds on my squat and without like almost predictably i would throw my knee out on the left side every time oh. every time and then i would have to like bring it back to whatever bar and then 135 and then da -da 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 back up to 185 and then yep. I'd injure my knee again. And then I would have to start. And then I just, at one point I was like, how many times am I going to do this <laughs> to my knee? And so I reach, so I had to look at the mechanics, left leg versus right leg. Mm -hmm. Do I have a butt wink at the bottom of the squat? Am I able to keep my, am I able to keep my back or my rounding? Right. That's what that butt wink is. It's like mm -hmm. just the, that, I mean, you know this, but for the, for the Betty's like, it's that sort of flexion of the sacrum that comes in that sort of makes your bum look like it's sort of coming in, even though there's no more flexion that's happening at the knee. Yeah. So I had to retrain myself how to do that. Mm -hmm. And of course now I can squat that amount. My knee, I don't throw that my knee out any anymore. Yeah. And I'll, I'll say this. I think that without stability, I, I think that you are going to, at least in my case, and, and it's been my observation that I don't think that you can build strength without stability. I think you can get up to a point, yes. but then there's going to be sort of like a limit. There's going to be this sort of limiting door that you just yeah. can't seem to pass through. And it's going to bring you back again. It's almost like you're playing a video game. You're trying to defeat the dragon or whatever yeah. in, in Super Mario and you fall off the track and then you got to start again. Right. That's, that's sort of how I feel about yeah. st like stability has to be part of or at least one of the levers that we think about when we think about building muscle and 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 looking at the integrity of bone and, and muscle anyway. Well, I love that you brought you brought that up because that is one of the primary reasons that I do not like my people working on machines. Listen, something is better than nothing. And you can augment all you want with a machine, but if that is all you do in circuits of machines, you are never asking for the true total body coordination of stability and right. strength because the machine well, the stabilizes is, the for is, you. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you can do augmentative lifts with that, but I don't think it should be your primary mode because you're never going to build the the whole organism stability that you just talked about. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Well said. My goodness. <laughs> we're like best so, friends. We're best yeah, friends. Yeah, we're just like best friends. I know. It's like, I don't know if you know this, but you're my new best friend yeah, now, whether or not you, I know. <laughs> you like it or not. <laughs> I love this so much. The the one thing I did want to make sure that we came back to, I was I sort of mentioned it in in our conversation is the lab that you were working in, I believe it was in late 90s, yep. early 2000s, yes. really was talking about satellite cells. So I wondered if you could just talk about that and then sort of now how we're seeing satellite cells yes. and, you know, the, the MSK system in general get the get the attention that it's so just that it's so due. I know. I, I, Thank you so much. So 
In, in 2000, actually, I worked in the stem cell lab of Dr. Johnny Huard at the University of Pittsburgh, and the muscle and the stem cell we were specifically working on was derived from muscle, actually. And we called it at the time muscle-derived stem cells. The other arm of orthopedics was working on mesenchymal stem cells, which we get from blood, from the pelvis, right? Yeah, and yeah. so these two lines were trying to figure out how, how to harness the power of these cells to heal the musculoskeletal system. And so these muscle-derived stem cells, we could make them turn into bone and muscle and fat and cartilage. We could ask them to do anything, and they so would. So the thing is, I had said to my lab group, I, had, I was a cancer nurse before I went back to medical school, and I worked in a hematology lab, and I said, I bet these things are, are really associated with the blood. They have to be associated with the blood. So lo and behold... They don't actually sit in the middle of the muscle. They sit next to the basement membranes of the vessels. And now we know that the muscle-derived stem cells are actually the muscle satellite cells, which even adults have stem cells in every tissue that are capable of becoming everything. They still retain that pluripotency. Muscle stem cells, if I isolated them, could become other things if I stimulated them. But when they sit in the muscle, they are critically important for the continued growth, continued repair of healthy muscle. Now, if we do nothing for ourselves, the decline in muscle over time, sarcopenia, loss of lean muscle mass, will go on unimpeded, meaning we will just get less and less muscle. We know this. But if we invest every day with the kinds of loads we're talking about, even if we invest every day by climbing up, d doing less loading, but more activity, we will still be able to maintain certain amounts of our muscle mass. I published a study which continues to be pasted on every gym wall. It's the one where I did an MRI of, of the thighs of triathletes, sedentary people and, and elderly active people. I think it's in one of my, I think it's one of my keynotes. I think maybe, I have it yes, my, it's, yeah, yes. It's like we, a 25 year old and a 65 year old and looking at the, at the muscle, muscle mass. Yes. I think it's your, uh, I think that's your, paper. yeah, it's, <laughs> it's my it's paper. My you know, everybody yeah. loves that, that image, but it just goes to show that these muscle stem cells and the stimulus we put on them really does matter across a lifespan. So we did this study, my lab did both human and, and murine or mouse studies, and we took these little old lady mice, they're two years old, little old lady mice are two years old, and they had about had it, right? They were just sitting in their cages. So we sampled their satellite cells and found that without the stimulation we were about to provide them, the cells were not dividing, they were not churning out growth factor, and they had turned on the cell signaling that would lead to death. Death is an active process in the body. It just doesn't, you know, you don't wear out. You turn on genes to die. We then mm. ran these little girl mice, these little old lady mice on treadmills. There really are mouse treadmills twice a day for two weeks. And then we resampled their, their muscle stem cells and found that they were producing growth factor. They had gone from spindly old cells, fibroblastic cells to round, plump, healthy cells that were dividing, and then they had turned off the signaling to program cell death. So we showed with something as simple as running these old mice on a treadmill, we could totally re-stimulate the fountain of youth, their stem cells. And so what we use that information with in humans, and this was in the lab of Dr. Fabrice Ambrosio, is we use that to prehab people for surgery. We wanted to mm. stimulate their muscle stem cells so that they could recover faster after surgery. And it's the basis of why I preach to people that we have to stimulate our muscles hard enough to cause the replication, the growth factor production uh, in satellite cells. So I love that work we did 20 years ago is being so flashed into the forefront. I feel frustrated that we were screaming from a mountaintop for 20 years until people finally heard. But people are hearing, so thank goodness. Yeah, yeah. There's usually like a 20-year lag between yeah. good research and sort of it coming into yeah. mainstream awareness and, and consciousness. Yeah. So I guess what I'm trying to say is thank you for your work. You're welcome. And, <laughs> and I thank you for your contribution to my keynote speech and to all You're the welcome. research that you do. This has just been absolutely an incredible conversation. I'm so happy 
that I've reached out to you. I'm so happy that I've gotten to know you over this co- your body of work and everything that you do. If people want to find out more about you and more about your work, where would I direct them? Yes. Yeah, so primarily right now I have time to keep my Instagram up to date. It's Dr. Vonda Wright, Dr. Vonda Wright. I also have my life's work of videos on YouTube. You can just search me and find me there. And I do have my own podcast, which you must come on. I've just restarted it called Hot for Your Health, where I try to have really innovative, interesting conversations with people like you. So please, in the future. But that's how people can find me and find out about my programs. Perfect. So I'll make sure that these are all clickable links. And of course, the answer is yes. I would love to be on your show. What an honor. Dr. Vonda Wright, thank you so much for your time today. This has just been a delight. Thank you so much for having me. 